Chapter 6.5. This section deals with oxygen and uh, how microbes have to deal with it. Um, this is probably something you don't think about. We think about living organisms and we just assume that they need oxygen to live. But in the microbial world, that is more of a question mark rather than an absolute statement. So there are lots of different microbes that can live without oxygen and in fact need to live with oxygen in some cases. Those are called anaerobes. We also have aerobes that uh, need oxygen to live and so we'll talk about the differences between them. Um, this has implications in how we grow different microbes and how we sample different surfaces and locations in the body. We'll uh, talk about how they can cause different diseases and uh, talk at a small level about uh, the chemical reactions that, that cause this. We will talk more about this in the metabolism chapter, but there are um, reactions called respiration and fermentation that kind of uh, play into this. So, question. Why do you need oxygen to live? I want you to pause the video and think about this for a second. Why do you need oxygen? Okay, so uh, to breathe is probably your answer, but what does that do? Well, it puts oxygen into your blood, but what does that do, right? Where does that oxygen go and what is its ultimate purpose? For you as an aerobic organism, the oxygen that you breathe in, it is what we call the final electron acceptor when we generate ATP by this process called oxidative phosphorylation. I don't expect you to really understand what this means right now, but in the coming sections, we will be talking about metabolism and there's a series of reactions in your body that break down your food and generate high energy electrons. And they go into a process called the electron transport chain that pumps hydrogen ions outside of part of the mitochondria and those flow back in and generate ATP. In the process, these electrons, they get sucked up by oxygen in the very last step of ATP generation. So without this oxygen, you cannot generate ATP, your cellular energy, and you would ultimately die because of this. You can do some non-oxygen uh, using reactions called uh, lactic acid fermentation. You've probably heard of this if you're a keen exerciser. Um, we have aerobic respiration, right? And then if you work real, real hard, you go into what's called anaerobic respiration. But you can only do that for a short period of time because it can't generate enough energy to keep you a large living organism alive. So uh, we have to have this aerobic respiration. But this isn't the case for microbes. Microbes are small, so they can get away with less overall energy production because they're smaller. They, they need less uh, relative to us. So not some microbes do this, but not all do this. Some will do uh, fermentation reactions and that can allow them to live. Some will do a process called anaerobic respiration where they do something similar but oxygen is not the last electron acceptor in that process. For some microbes, oxygen is actually toxic to them. The first microbes on Earth would have lived in an environment that had very low oxygen. And oxygen is actually kind of toxic in some ways because it's highly reactive. It wants to react with other uh, atoms that can create dangerous byproducts like hydrogen peroxide that you might know we use to clean wounds and things like that, that can kill microbes because it's highly reactive. Um, so there are some microbes for which oxygen is toxic. So if we look at uh, an example here, a case study, we have a patient who comes in with extreme pain when their abdomen is touched. And uh, so this kind of indicates that there might be something inflamed or um, uh, you know, swollen in there. And so they do an exploratory surgery and find that the appendix is enlarged. So your appendix is 
what we call a vestigial organ. We don't really believe it has much of a purpose because you can live without it, but we think it's related to structures um, that things like ruminants have and, and stuff like that. So uh, we kind of lost the use of it in our evolution, but our ancestors probably had a use for it. But sometimes microbes can get in there and cause an infection which can uh, lead to inflammation and swelling. And untreated, that can be deadly because it can rupture and spread those microbes throughout the body cavity, which can lead to all kinds of uh, bad side effects there. So the microbes can get out into the blood and cause sepsis and um, things like that. So we need to take a blood sample and culture or grow the microbes to figure out what is in there and what's causing it because we are going to need to prescribe antibiotics. We're going to remove the appendix, right? But some of those microbes might get out. We want to treat them with antibiotics. So we need to know what they are. You treat gram positives differently than you treat gram negatives with antibiotics. Now, here's a problem. A lot of the gastrointestinal tract is a slightly anaerobic environment. There's very low oxygen in there. So we have to grow our microbes smartly. To get all of the possible microbes that could be there, we need to grow them under different conditions. We need to grow them with oxygen and without oxygen. And to do that, we have these little vials. Um, one of these is for aerobic culture and one of them is for anaerobic culture. And we need to use both of these to grow things that can live with oxygen and things that can't live with oxygen. So in this case, the technician found no bacteria in the bottle with oxygen, but lots of growth in the one uh, that is anaerobic, so no oxygen. In this case, it was found to be Bacteroides fragilis, which is uh, kind of a normal part of the intestines, but it got into the appendix and started an infection there. The intestines are pretty much oxygen free. So if we didn't culture it properly, we would have missed this if we had only grown it with oxygen. Now, if you think about what we've done in the lab, we've grown uh, microbes on plates and we grew them in the air. Um, how do you grow something without oxygen? Because oxygen is part of our atmosphere. Well, it's a little tricky. I'm going to show you at the end of this chapter uh, exactly how that's done. But first, let's define these different microbes. We have a group that we call the strict aerobes. That means they have to be aerobic. They require oxygen for energy metabolism, aerobic respiration. Um, they have to have that oxygen. And I said oxygen is kind of dangerous because it, it likes to react with other molecules. And it can form what are called reactive oxygen species. This isn't like um, uh, bacterial species. This is just different molecules is what it means. So reactive oxygen molecules. Call it ROS. These are things like hydrogen peroxide. Aerobes have evolved enzymes to detoxify or get rid of these toxic products. So that allows them to survive in environments with oxygen. They can no longer live without oxygen though. On the other side of the spectrum, we have these strict anaerobes. They cannot live with oxygen. They don't require oxygen for energy metabolism and usually they're unable to detoxify these reactive oxygen species, which makes oxygen toxic to them. If they're exposed to it, they die. So they can only survive in environments without oxygen. Many of these will do a process called fermentation, which is a way of extracting energy from food, but it's not very efficient. For microbes, it's fine. Um, they, you know, don't need as much energy as we do. So it works just fine. Most of our intestinal bacteria live in an anaerobic environment. Um, some of them are strict anaerobes. So if you were to um, take samples and grow them on oxygen containing uh, media or plates, they would not grow well. They would die and you would miss them. So we're going to look at this example here. I've slightly modified this from our book. Uh, here we have a tube that has different concentrations of dissolved oxygen. So at the top, there's a lot of oxygen. 
as you start to go down, the oxygen concentration goes down and at the bottom, there is no oxygen. We say no oxygen, it's just so low that we consider it nothing. So up at the top, we would find our strict aerobes here. They would grow just fine up here, but they could not grow in these lower areas. Anaerobic organisms would need to grow down here. And then there's this whole range where there's this group of microbes we call facultative or aerotolerant um, anaerobes. Facultative microbes can kind of live everywhere. Aerotolerant uh, anaerobes, uh, they do anaerobic respiration, but they can tolerate this oxygen. They can detoxify it. They just don't use it. Facultative can use oxygen or they cannot use oxygen. Uh, that They can facilitate many different types here. So facultative can do fermentation or respiration. And there's two types of respiration, like I said. You have aerobic that uses oxygen or anaerobic that does the same process but not using oxygen. These generate more energy than fermentation. And we'll see that in the metabolism chapter. These can survive with or without oxygen. They're, they're tolerant in both environments. Aerotolerant anaerobes um, generally use uh, fermentation. Um, they prefer those anaerobic conditions, but they can survive the oxygen side. They, they, can, they can detoxify some of those reactive oxygen species. Um, again, we haven't fully described fermentation and respiration, so uh, this will make a little bit more sense when we go through it in detail in the next chapter. So let's look at some examples. Um, some aerobic microbes that we might be interested in. Uh, what have we talked about? We've talked about Neisseria, um, causes uh, meningitis or gonorrhea in some cases. That's an aerobe. Um, Mycobacterium leprae, the causative agent of leprosy. That's an aerobe. Um, some facultative organisms, we got things like E. coli, which is normally in our intestines, so it can survive both oxygen and not oxygen. Um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, yeast, which is not a bacteria, it's a fungus actually, single-celled fungi. Uh, this is used for baking, right? So if you like fluffy risen bread or uh, fermented alcoholic beverages. Uh, yeast is very important. Um, as fermentation occurs, uh, it breaks down those sugars and releases CO2. And those bubbles are what make your bread rise or your beer fizzy. And one of the byproducts of that fermentation is CO2, but also ethyl alcohol, which makes your beer alcoholic. Um, your bread loses the alcohol when you bake it, it evaporates off. Uh, in the middle here, um, what have we talked about? Clostridium. Uh, we've talked about Clostridium botulinum, uh, where we get the Botox toxin, the paralytic toxin. Um, it's an anaerobic organism. It does not like oxygen. So I spent a lot of time talking about this, and um, this is one of the ones where I think it's important to understand why we're learning about this, because... It's super critical for diagnosing illness um, and sample collection, which uh, a lot of people say, why am I learning this stuff? I'm not gonna be the do diagnosis, that's the person in the lab. Well, you may be the person who does the sample collection and you need to be able to understand the difference between someone that says, uh, you know, I need an anaerobic sample and an aerobic sample. So, uh, there is different technique for swabbing wounds depending on whether they're deep body wounds, um, intestinal wounds, or surface wounds. We suspect different things, right? On the surface, we might suspect aerobes, but like internally, we might suspect anaerobes could be causing an infection. So this is straight from a nursing class, okay? I, I went out and found um, some curriculum from a nursing class to illustrate why this uh, understanding anaerobic versus aerobic is so important. And they talk about separate techniques for collecting specimens uh, to, to find aerobic versus anaerobic microorganisms. Our aerobic are on superficial wounds that are exposed to the air, whereas anaerobic organisms tend to grow deep in body cavities where there's not normally oxygen present. So they have a, 
in in this nursing class, they have a whole thing that talks about um, we have to um, look at uh, the wound and collect different samples from it, um, particularly if it looks like it's infected. And you actually collect different samples for aerobic versus anaerobic, and then the lab will grow them differently. And um, you have to process them and place them in the correct containers. If you do not do this correctly, then the sample gets corrupted and uh, you could miss, cause a misdiagnosis. So um, doing this technique properly and understanding the differences is critical to properly diagnosing infections. So I hinted earlier that growing things anaerobically is tough, right? There's oxygen all around us. How do we how do we get rid of that? Well, when you're collecting a sample, there are special tubes that have like a little rubber gasket in it that you'll take the swab out of, put the swab in the wound, put it back in the tube, and then there's a little capsule in there that you you break that basically does a reaction that gets rid of all the oxygen in there. And if you want to grow like a liquid culture, there are jars that do the same thing. They have a little pack in there that will basically, a chemical reaction occurs and, and all the oxygen gets broken down into uh, CO2. There are also special anaerobic chambers with little airlocks on them and they're glove boxes. So they're fully airtight that you can use in the lab to work on these things. We obviously don't have one of these. It's a very specialized piece of equipment. Uh, it looks very tricky to work with because you're working through this giant glass uh, or plexiglass shield and uh, using these gloves. So uh, this, this is really uh, specialized lab equipment for diagnosing anaerobes. And there are a lot of anaerobic diseases. As I mentioned, we have things like tetanus, botulism, gangrene. These are all common anaerobic uh, microbes that cause disease. Okay, so know the definitions. Uh, things like strict aerobes, they require oxygen for growth because it is the terminal electron acceptor um, and that allows it to make ATP. Aerobes, uh, they they can't really ferment in a lot of cases, um, unless they're strict aerobes, I should say. Um, they have enzymes to destroy reactive oxygen species. Um, in the On the other hand, the other side of the spectrum, strict anaerobes, oxygen is toxic. They have to do fermentation, um, and they don't have enzymes to destroy reactive oxygen species. Then we have the middle ones um, in here, facultative. Um, they can grow in the presence or absence of oxygen. Um, facultative organisms can grow with or without oxygen. They do uh, both fermentation and respiration. They're kind of a jack of all trades. Then we have aerotolerant. They can only do fermentation, um, but they can tolerate a little bit of oxygen in there. All right, that's it for 6.5. Last one next.